Greetings, everyone. We're, we're just about ready to get started. We have two more minutes, so we're just going to let everyone, we'll give it a, we'll give them their two minutes. Hopefully more folks are going to join us as they grab their lunch and get ready to go. Um, and I think Dalton just stepped out of the room. We're actually going to be sitting side by side today. He's the host. I'm the presenter. And this is our second, um, you know, backyard series. And it's going to be moss because we just want to have some more pollinator information. Good. So Dalton just did a test. You can see the screen. The presentation is up. And I'll just spend a little time. This is um, this is titled More Pollinators. And we did this during Moth Week in 2020 when we were all, remember, you know, locked up at home for COVID. And so so what we were doing is these virtual presentations and just making them as as full of sweet nectar and pollen. Oops, I mean um interesting things for you to learn about your backyard um, so that you know we could share more about Florida friendly landscaping but we could also get you out there enjoying your own backyards and then when everyone was able to go ahead and and get out and about you could go visit parks oops sorry we're we're getting a little bit of feedback there so um, I'll just get started it's well wait a minute I'll give it one more minute. So I'll finish the introduction. My name is Barbara McAdam, Urban Hort Program Specialist with UF IFAS Extension, Miami-Dade County. And we are part of the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. And we are partnered under the, uh, the website of Parks, Recreation, and Open Spaces. And the next slide acknowledges, and it's not going to next slide. Oh, I'll do it there. No, I, I can use that now, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are funded. Our major funders are Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department because Florida-friendly landscaping creates landscapes that can exist primarily on rainfall. All of the nine principles work together to make a sustainable landscape that uses less water, less inputs of chemicals, fertilizers, and pesticides. And we are also funded by Department of uh, Resource Management, DERM, and by Miami-Dade County Solid Waste Department. Solid Waste Department totally um, funds the uh, compost workshops where you attend that and you can get a free composter. And Water and Sewer Department is providing the free um, irrigation rebirth, uh, rebate where we do the assessments. And you can also get a $50 rebate on a rain barrel. We just did a workshop this past weekend at Miami Beach Botanical Garden. Yay, beautiful garden. Shout out to our friends over there. So, um, and we also work very, very closely. Uh, we coordinate, of course, with Parks, Recreation, Open Spaces. We're within the eco division and that encompasses the parks that are within natural areas. And we work closely with EELS, Environmentally Endangered Land Program, and the Miami-Dade County Office of Resilience, all of the good things. So um, as I mentioned, we did this during Moth Week 2020. And these are just a few little bits of information about moths. We're going to go more into detail on that. But as we're doing this, keep in mind that I'll be sharing the PDF with everyone. And all of the links here that you see in the PowerPoint will be live. So you can go and visit your um, these sites yourself. So I am on countdown. This was as of yesterday, 311 days, 21 hours, and 21 minutes till Moth Week next year, July 20th through 28th, 2024. Yeah, and this happens every year um, in the month of July. And uh, why would it just be in the month of July? So, um, because we have peak flying season. So this will be a good point for everybody to remember in the future um, that even though we're green all year long down here, 
why don't we have peak diversity with these beautiful flying insects with mobs and butterflies? Why don't we just see these, these gorgeous things just flying all the time, all year long? Well, because it's kind of an illusion. Yes, we're green because we don't really get cold weather um, and most of the trees retain their leaves. But there's actually a three hour, 17 minute difference between the winter solstice and the summer solstice. So there's less daylight and we get into dry season. So those leaves aren't flushing out and pushing out new growth that would be tender and very palatable for young caterpillars of moths and butterflies and other insects. So at the end of dry season, those things are getting pretty dried out and not very nutrition. So that's why we have peak season. And July is really peak. And we're pretty close to peak right now and we will be for a while longer. So at the end of this presentation, I hope you guys will get out there tonight with a white sheet or something and a flashlight. So let's go. Um, this was just recently and I believe it was the New York Times. And this is, you know, I have some unsung heroes, which should be acknowledged. And everyone knows that I, I read science for lunch because I have to feed my curiosity every day. And one of my favorite resources is the Florida Museum. And this was a, a, an interview with Akita Kawahara, who's director and curator of Lepidoptera at the Florida Museum um, of Natural History. But you can just say Florida Museum that's on campus at UF in Gainesville. So we have, he's drawing your attention. And just as I am, if I appear a little bit nervous today is because I just really, really want you to realize the potential of this whole other world of pollinators and flying insects. Um, there's 160 species of mobs eight times more species of moths than there are butterflies. When we think of a, of a monarch flying near flowers on a summer day, which are highly visible, and then we think about a moth circling a, a light at night, which one do you think caught your attention? Well, of course, it's a big, bold monarch, which goes, oh, yes, there's pollinators here, because that's almost a five and a half, six inch butterfly. And you may not have noticed those tiny little moths or maybe even some big ones around the lights on your back porch, but they are major pollinators as well. And this is just going to open up a whole lot more you're, you've been missing out on. So one in 10 species of living things on our planet is a moth. And recent studies by the Sussex um, Oh my goodness, I forgot the name. It's in Su um, University of Sussex in Britain showed that moths are more efficient at pollinator than even bees. Oh my goodness, wait till Tony finds out about that. <laughs> I want to dispute that. And our songbirds, remember when we talked about our migratory birds last month? They are, a lot of them sip nectar and they're, they're not in breeding season here, but when they are in breeding season, Birds are going to feed their babies good protein and 96% of what they're going to feed their little baby birds are moth caterpillars. But um, hopefully we'll have a healthy enough environment for everything to thrive. So um, quickly before we continue, uh, if anyone has any questions for Barbara at any point, you can post them in the question and answer section of, of the, uh, you can see on the bottom of your screen. And I will direct those to her at the end of the presentation. Okay. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Dom. So, of course, I actually joined the news feed for Florida Museums. So it's in my inbox probably about once a week. And these are just some of the things. Well, what I did with this, um, let me just be clear about this one. I, I know how to go to that website and find things like uh, natural history, what what different research is going on, uh, what's at the museum. And for this one, I just went in and I put moths in the search uh, in the search box because one of the things I found there, which just totally fascinated me, and you'll hear this question a lot, is um, what are the differences between moths and butterflies? And um, why do Luna moths have those long tails? What's that for? 
And what are those eye spots on butterflies that we see on butterflies and moths and, and um, you know, all sorts of questions like that. I'm just as curious as that my, my inner eight year old is still, still very much alive and active. So this is just, just to clarify, we do still think that butterflies were first and that moths evolved from butterflies, but research is always ongoing and moths may have uh, evolved so they could ev um, invade predators. So what are some of the differences? Well, mainly uh, butterflies do the pollination uh, during the day. They're big and bold and beautiful and moths are going to work as the butterflies are going to bed. But there are always, always, always exceptions. There are, well, I don't think there's too many butterflies that fly at night unless you disturb their roosting area, but there are some moths that are active during the day. And they are most certainly moths that are active during the dusk hours of evening and dawn. There's a lot of critters that are around at those dusky hours. It's one of my favorite watching times in the backyard. Uh, butterflies, for the most part, are more colorful because they're attracting mates during the daylight hours. Um, they sleep at night. Usually they sleep with their wings folded, which might be why their wings are not as colorful and patterned uh, ornate as the upper part. So they're kind of trying to camouflage themselves. But night flying moths attract mates by smell. And they're what appears to us as these brown patterned, sometimes intricately patterned grays and browns and blacks um, will help camouflage them in daytime resting. And moths have those little, butterflies have those little antennae with a little, uh, little, little uh, club on the end of it. Moths have these really beautiful feather-like or tapered to a point. And they actually use the surface areas on the um, on those feathery antennae to pick up the the scents, the pheromones. Um, hey, next time you go to buy perfume, just say, "I'm going shopping for some pheromones today. What pheromones do I want?" Mm -hmm. um, and so moths rely less, males rely less on scent and more on vision for mates um, for butterflies, and moths do the opposite. So I love this. What else is different? Well, you know, moths always look like thicker and fluffy and furry. Um, since they fly at night, it's cooler at night. They're not getting solar warmth. So they need to, they actually, you know, they shiver just like we do to help uh, to heat their muscles. And this is what, oops, this is what those, um, their scales look like. And again, we haven't talked about butterflies yet, but like hummingbirds, how they hummingbirds have uh, the feathers or have a crystalline structure to them. So do moths and uh, butterflies, and those refract the light. So you can see different colors as they move around. These are the magnified scales of a hawk moth, and you can just see how instead of being big and flat, they're numerous and fluffy, and they will help like just to hold in that heat. 40 degrees centigrade, they wanna stay at 104 degrees Fahrenheit. They're pretty, you know, remember they're, uh, they're invertebrates, they're not mammals, so they have no way of keeping themselves warm. So well, this is just some of the re research that um, Dr. Kawahara's lab has been doing, and they have uh, identified the, the the relationships and diverse diversification patterns of uh, 2,244 butterflies. So um, this is not all of the butterflies. I can't wait until they get to work on moths. And oh my goodness, I want this poster like blown up for my wall. Um, I just love all of the inner relationships. And you can even see if you look closely on this, you can see what family of plant they use as a larval host and also what they depend on as their favorite nectar sources. So we're gonna get through these resources and get to the moths themselves. So another question, hmm, if you were here live, I would ask you, are moths bigger? Do we have the 
what's the biggest, moths or butterfly? And of course, then we could also go to who has the smallest species, but this is uh, an atlas moth from Southeast Asia. And Dalta could tell you, if you look at the upper wing tips, they look like snakes, don't they? This is definitely a camouflage, mm -hmm, goodness. He's got, Dalton has showed a, a photo of another uh, large moth that looked like multiple snakes. So this is meant to camouflage. This guy might be the winner at about 10 inches, but we have butterflies almost as large. Again, from Southeast Asia. And this is the Queen Alexandra's birdwing. Um, birdwing butterflies are the largest of the butterfly world, just exquisite. Um, and there's movement on to protect both of these because they are so large and beautiful. Of course, they get over collected. Um, and, you know, these are, please look, if you want, uh, if you want to collect this, collect a photograph, not the actual specimen. So Moth Week, we'll touch back on that. Just uh, for the kids inside of us and for our family members, there's lots of fun activities associated with this. And you can enjoy moths anytime. Remember peak flight seasons and sign up and register to do some of these activities when it comes up again in July next year. So this is one of the things that they talk about. And this is a... a the white sheet with the light. You can see that the scientist in this is wearing actually a headlamp and he's out in the desert. This is from Arizona. I don't know if it's Arizona State, uh, but he's looking at hawk moths and other moths and they're actually counting the different species, how many different species and the number of each that are visiting for research and they are attracted to the fragrant um, flowers of datura that's blooming in the southwest West desert. So I have read um, some, some notes from Xerxes Society, which I follow very closely, which is um, um, a little concerned about too many people doing these uh, attempts to, to attract moths at night. But what I would say is go dark, go dark around your house. Um, if you Try to come visit me at night in Redland. You better bring a flashlight because my back door, my front door, I don't have any lights on so that I won't disturb the bats and the moths and every other critter that's out there at night and migratory birds as well. And so I don't feel bad about taking a, a white sheet out with a flashlight on occasion to try to attract some moths to view at night. Um, I would say I would be more concerned about the amount of street lights and, of course, all the light that we have from our cities. We, we don't realize until, you know, you start to drive west on, on a, towards the west coast and you get out on, on and find there's no street lights and you're under full moonlight in the middle of the Everglades. Then you start to appreciate what happens when we lose all of the ambient light that we have around us constantly. But this is the proboscis of the um, adult hawk moth. So that's pretty long. So we're gonna be exploring some of the flowers that they visit for nectar. So here's the simple way to do that, simple flashlight. And of course you can use um, a UV light as well. And there's just a little more who evolved from, from what, if you want to, um, I'll put the links on that so you can, you can see what the current thinking is of how butterflies became uh, moths who fly mostly at night. And there's a specimen room. Boy, would I love to get back there in that specimen room. So these are collected for research. Please do not collect. And that is what will greet you at the um, Florida Museum. And yeah, those butterflies are really blown up so you can see them, but please don't forget that there's, there's just all these little micro minis, unsung heroes that are out there doing the pollinator work. So one of the other resources, which I just really, really love, this is Keys Moth. And this is 
I call him, it's David Fine, also known as Mothman. So his website is the bomb. If you want to know the mobs that you can find here in South Florida, he has detailed and taken photos of moths in the Keys. So this is going to be, yeah, Dalton just wrote that down. <laughs> uh, and, and do take some time to see that opening video that he has on there. I mean, I've never seen a green malachite butterfly. Of course, David has seen them. I don't see Luna moths here. David has seen them. So beautiful photos, and you'll just explore the whole world of moths. So there he is, Mr. Mothman, and he has a beautiful moth family. They've identified over 599 moth species. That's 600. I bet he's up to 600 by now. So um, let's look at this one, which you'll see a lot of times. Um, this comes up in conversation a lot, the hummingbird moth with those clear wings. Well, it actually doesn't come this far south, but, but anytime you start talking about moths and you say, oh, I've seen the hummingbird moth during the day. This is a fascinating moth, beautiful. I'm glad that people are, are getting more aware of moths. Um, and it is a, a moth from Florida. So let's look at some that you can expect to see. Well, this is one. And this moth, um, I'd love to ask you guys, but nobody can answer. Does anyone know what this moth is? Um, and like butterflies, moths have many myths and legends attached to them. This one is a little, hmm, maybe just in time for Halloween at Daring Estate, a little spooky. So it's the black witch moth. Um, and it's pretty large. Things are in centimeters here, just divide by 2.54. So quickly, it's about a six inch moth. And yeah, this looks kind of browns and beige until you shine a light on it. And then you will see all of those incredible ultraviolet colors without using an ultraviolet light. Um, and this is present throughout the Caribbean. It's pretty much globally secure, although some areas of the range, it might be less seen. And that would be from lack of habitat um, and its larval host. And here they identify it as Cassias, but they really need to update that to the Senna species. So, most of the cassia plant family have been reclassified as Senna. I love this one photo up here. It looks like a B-52 bomber. Uh, yes, the butterflies, uh, the bombers turn into butterflies above the skies. Thank you, Joni Mitchell. Um, I'll forever have that, um, that image in my head. And you can also, but I'm not sure how to tell now, you can tell by the comma that you see on the wing whether this is male or female. I happen to know that one was male because it was in my garage. Um, so if you go to the Wikipedia website, I'm gonna spare you the scary parts. Um, this is the good stuff. Um, in Hawaii, the black witch moth mythology says that if a loved one has passed away, it is them returning to say goodbye and let you know that everything is okay and that they love you. In the Bahamas, it's known as the money moth or money bats. And supposedly if one lands on you or if you can touch one, you'll have money or you might supposedly win the lottery. So let's leave it at the good stuff. Um, <laughs> you know, everything is all part of the cycle of life. And I just think this is an incredibly beautiful, I, my heart flutters when I see it fly out from its roosting spot. And that's what the caterpillar looks like. So we might actually find this in your backyard. We've seen these here at the extension office and I've seen them at home and I've seen them at um, Castillo Hammock. One was roosting last year during their open house event. It was a rainy day. So it was roosting right on the wall where we could all have just a perfect view of it. Um, so maybe it'll be at Castillo Hammock for open house again this year, coming up a couple of weeks. So 
The larval hosts for these are also a larval host for butterflies mm -hmm. and will also serve as nectar for other um, pollinators. So we have both of our uh, Senna, Senna ligostina and um, Senna um, mexicana. So these are both excellent pollinator plants. Giant leopard moths. Boy, one year I had the I had the summer of giant leopard moth caterpillars all over my yard. Wow. And while I was doing outreach to different summer camps, I was taking those caterpillars with me and letting the kids, they look scary. They look like they're gonna sting you. Don't those look like stinging spines? They're actually will tickle you. And this moth uses a lot of different plants as a larval host. So yeah, I had a lot of things in my yard that were getting all chewed up, um, but I loved it. And and I had folks, please, can I have the caterpillars? I'm like, well, what do you have in your yard to keep feeding it? And you know, quite a few people had had something that this caterpillar would eat. It's not that big a moth, but I love the black and white pattern there. I love color, but I also love intricate patterns. So pretty cool moth. Um, and the, we actually took them to United Cerebral Palsy for summer camp that year. That's a plan of the just a little breakout garden that we created there. They planted it and they painted the rain barrel. That was a great group of kids. I really enjoyed visiting them that summer. Io moth. Well, this one wants to look like an owl to scare the predator away. And even if the predator is attracted to those eye spots, they're just going to get part of the wing and not an important body part. So IO moths are beautiful, but beware their caterpillars. Um, and I'll let you guys read this. This, this has got Hera and Zeus and, and all kinds of gods and jealousy and and just a whole, I don't know, Shakespearean play written into the mythology of Io Moss, but pretty fun. And if you follow that link there to Featured Creatures website, that gives you the larval host and it also will give you the flight seasons. It will give you tons of information if you want to track this moth. So Beware of the caterpillars, however, because these are one of the few uh, moth or butterfly caterpillars that will sting. And it's, you know, quite a bit of um, pain um, because the little tips get embedded. You can use uh, scotch tape and it's it's not going to um, you're not going to get any help from an antihistamine. Unfortunately, that won't uh, like you can't just go swig the Benadryl and the pain will go away. So it's going to, you're going to have to wait till it subsides, maybe some ice. Um, so beware of these and also know that it, it even in the small caterpillar instar stage, first instar, or even as eggs, this can sting you. And it can be on just about anything. Those are caterpillars on an exora. And I was about to run my hands over the top of the leaves when I noticed the caterpillars. I had oh. some on some bougainvillea in my house. Yeah, it hurt, didn't it? My, my, luckily, I didn't get it, but my girlfriend did. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, there's a couple of there's a couple of moths that can sting. Not too many, not like Australia. <laughs> so this is one of the is this. Are, you can get confused. This is the oleander caterpillar wasp moth. Is it a wasp or a moth? It's mimicking a wasp. Stay away from me. I'll sting you. And all those black hairs on the caterpillar look like I'm going to sting you. But no, they'll tickle you to death. Mm -hmm. um, but it will totally annihilate oleander because it will just eat that up to the point where the oleander cannot recover, but it's really a fascinating uh, moth. I don't know what to do. If you, if you have thick shrubs of oleander, you'll probably get a lot of them. Um, I would like to say that it will recover because most plants totally recover from, from caterpillars. Um, 
feeding on them, but not in this case. So there you go. But one thing fascinating, they don't use pheromones or, you know, moth perfume, but they sing to each other. So the, is it the female? Yes, the female emits an ultrasonic acoustic signal, which attracts the male. So she's singing to them. And all right, which brings us to the point, wow, moths can make sounds, moths can speak, and moths can hear. Moths have ears <clears throat> or moth earrings. Uh, yes, uh, both. Um, and that was the Atlas moth again. Wow. And Luna moth earrings. But yes, um, moth ears. So, and they've developed toxins to ward off uh, as plants develop toxins. And butterflies started to tolerate them. Everybody sort of keeps advancing. Oh, something so something skipped in my my slides here. But this, I'm going to show you a moth ear. I hope it didn't disappear from the slides. But uh, some moths can hear, and some moths do not have ears. But the, why do you think we have the tail on the beautiful Luna moth? And this is our Luna moth from the United States. Um, I have some earrings that are from the moon moth or Luna moth from China. Um, but those long tails are kind of twisting and just deflecting the sonar of bats and maybe Antillian or some of our common night hawks. Were you going to do that night hawk echolocation? <laughs> okay, never mind. We're not going to do it. Maybe we'll do it um, uh, when we do the birds again at the fruit and spice park. We'll call them at, in the evening. But and there are several species of birds. Uh, well, well, we know that bats are flying around at night, but there are other species of birds that use echo lo location and night hawks are one of them. So, and again, maybe they would detect the moth. Maybe the moth is like, they're gonna hear me anyhow. Let me uh, get them to go for my tail instead of my head. You know, I can survive without a tail. And there's been a couple of uh, studies, uh, again, from Dr. Kawahara's uh, lab on exactly how the tails evolved. Does the male have a bigger show of your tail to attract a mate? And it, it comes out pretty much that the long tail is not used for any mating showy purposes, but it's, it's more used to deflect an attacker. And you might also notice that butterflies and moths, for the most part, are kind of clumsy flyers. That's by design. Because just think if you're a butter, you're a bird up there and you spot this butterfly or you've got really good night vision, you're an owl and you spot a moth, but you notice how erratic they fly, they're this way, then they're that way. If you try to zero in and you know dive for them, at the last minute, they could change direction because it looks like that's just a clumsy mistake. That could just throw the throw that predator off just enough for the butterfly or the moth to survive. So, hey, it isn't pretty. I've seen better flyers, but I'm still here. <laughs> Maybe missing a little part of my wing, but ready to keep going. I like the way the lower part with the eyes looks like the eyes of an elephant and the trunk of an elephant. Pretty interesting. So moth ears, as promised. Um, there they are underneath all of those scales to keep them warm. Very, very cool. And yeah, that moth doesn't look very bright and enticing. You have to appreciate the subtle and think about how it looks under different light. There's also a study on the Kawahara's lab website on butterflies and moths under different light sources. You need to, I'll, I'll share that with you if you send me an email. So the Luna moth was once a stamp. It was honored as a stamp. And I must admit, I don't see too many of these around in my yard, but I hope to, to get more. And I think I just skipped path, past it. Wing sumac. This is certainly a very cool native plant that we could have in our backyard. So 
It's also a larval host for the red banded hair streak. So I could have a larval host for a butterfly and a moth and nectar. So maybe I just need to make sure I get this one in my backyard so I can see them again. And we've seen this one here at the extension. This is um, somewhat secure. There's some decline because of pesticides that have been used in attempt to control the gypsy moth population. This is a beautiful pink and yellow moth um, and it's throughout the entire United States. But it's, um, it seems to, the numbers seem to be going down. So this can be up to six, almost eight inches. This can be a very large moth. And it uses um, the live oak. So if you have oak trees, you could possibly see this. I've seen the moth at home where I have oak trees and I've seen the moth here where there are oak trees nearby. Oak trees are one of those like, um, their diversity superfood for many forms of life, for, for larval hosts, for many butterflies, home to many uh, hummingbirds, uh, collect the, the, the pollen. So they're eating protein and hummingbirds usually sip nectar. So if you have space for an oak, it needs to be somewhere in your community, maybe a giant swale, or if you have a big yard, please plant one. So this guy, Pluto Spink Moth. It took me a couple of years before I finally saw this um, as common knowledge everywhere. And I actually went to Adrian Hunsberger before she retired to identify this. Um, the Pluto Spink Moth. One day I came home and the two fire bush that I had just planted, uh, one of them did not have a single leaf left on it. And there was this giant caterpillars all over it like that. Pretty cute guys, aren't they? Wow, they just really ate up um, ate up my fire bush, but I was happy to be a moth mother. And this is just such a gorgeous, velvety, rich, mossy green. And it lays its caterpillars. The caterpillars are in the ground. So as I was kind of um, you know, digging around and planting things, I would from time to time find one of these caterpillars and they would be like wiggly squiggly. And I go, oops, let me put that back in the ground. Um, so yeah, so check this one out and um, and do get some firebush. I know that sometimes it may have its issues, but firebush is again, a pollinator superfood um, for all kinds of insects and butterflies and hummingbirds out there and the fruit. So nectar, fruit, superfood. If, if, if you have um, tomatoes or tobacco in your yard or if you ever grow any of those, that caterpillar may look similar to something you've seen before called the uh, tobacco hornworm or tomato hornworm. And that's another kind of sphinx moth. Um, so sometimes those sphinxes, yeah, we're going to see it. Oh, nice. Yeah. Those sphinxes will have those crazy little horns on their butts there. Yeah. Right. Well, I don't know which one is that, uh, you know, knowing this, what, what happens in nature, I would say what looks like eyes is probably the other end. No, actually, I think you can just about... see the mouth right there. So maybe a little more, but, um, we're actually going to look at those, uh, the the, uh, the the one that is a pest on our tomato plants. So this is another moth that appeared in my at my back door. Actually, uh, my youngest says, "Mom, come check out this huge moth," and he was hanging out at my back door. You can see we were doing a little work on uh, putting in a new frame and everything. And I'm like, he wasn't there smelling my dinner. It was actually just there, he or she. I believe that might be a male. Um, this is, a again, a large moth. And it was there getting ready to fly out for the night. Uses the grape, the native grapes, um, and also um, those cissus vine, which can get kind of uh, overgrown. And it can also uh, be an irritant. But... And yeah, we're sure that it, it nectars from, we're gonna look at some of the flowers that these guys are gonna be 
um, sipping from once they have uh, hatched and you know evolved off their nectar or their larval host sources. You want both. You want the nectar source and you want the larval host source. So this is another plant. Um, and you have to be careful, there's a non-native version of this, which just gets everywhere. And this one's actually quite aggressive also. And most of the time it's not recommended for um, general landscape use. But look at everything that comes to it for nectar. Mm -mm -mm. And it's a larval host plant. So maybe I would tolerate some weed pulling and have that in my yard. And maybe it doesn't look so pretty all year long, but I know it's just a pollinator magnet. So mournful sphinx, pretty cool looking guy too. And uh, if you ever see one of these just resting somewhere, get the flashlight and see what happens to the color on all of the patterns on that wing. So again, it's going to use grapes. So what's our native grape called? Um, it just slipped my uh, head. Mus muscadine. Muscadine, yes. I have a, a whole hedge of that. Um, in my front yard. So it's a larval host for this moth and also for the Gaudi sphinx moth. So it was no wonder. And that was just the most beautiful green you've ever seen. Oh my goodness, what did I do? Okay, hang on. We're coming back. There you go. <laughs> Don't press the button too many times. <laughs> All right. So again, this is going to go to the muscad muscadine, and also it's going to go to your peppers as a as a larval host. So if you see something on your peppers, it could be the caterpillars from this moth. Sorry, Dalton has this little tiny um, little tablet here. My fingers are too fat. I fat fingered that before. <laughs> and look at this. This is butterfliesandmoths.org. If you look, flight. This is giving you the flight season. So you know when this is, then the, the larval host plants have the tender leaves, the few that survive over winter are going to lay eggs and you're going to have several flight seasons where you have this, the adult caterpillars um, emerge from cocoons, moths uh, spin cocoons, butterflies are in a chrysalis and they begin all over. So you have two to three flight seasons um, used normally each year. So this one, is this the moth for this guy? Yeah, this is. Yeah, this one will hiss uh, if, you, if you mess with it. So I guess it's trying to make you think it's a snake. <laughs> that would be my guess. So pretty, pretty intricate. And there's the muscadine grape. Um, a lot of people do make, make wine from that. <clears throat> and it can cover a lot of real estate. But I will tell you that um, the little warblers love to flit in and out of this when they arrive. And we do, I should announce, we have spotted our first hummingbird on Monday here at the extension. And I have some warblers at my house already. So they like darting in and out of here and hunting for caterpillars. So the Bella moth, this is an exquisite little moth, but, um, and it also uses a pretty cool uh, native plant. The Bella moth, uh, the rattle box, it's actually a beautiful little plant. It's planted over at uh, Zoo Miami. And you can see this moth hanging out sometimes on the wall. I see it when I'm going into the grocery store sometime. There's just, you know, the lights are on and it's dusk and there's this moth and I've just got to stop and take a, a look at it. Sphinx moths, because they they look like the the sphinx sitting up, uh, the way their their caterpillar has that tail sort of sticking up. And this, this, this sphinx moth, hawk moth, hawk moths, because they're of their size, they have long proboscis of their tongues. And this is one of the plants we have in our landscape that we noticed 
just started flowering um, and has a lot of buds on it. It's absolutely a gorgeous um, native lily. Um, we have the Hymenocallis latifolia in our landscape and it's fragrant. You can still smell it if you walk up to it first thing in the morning. And it's the flowers last for two days and it's, it's white and translucent. And um, as I try to get close to it to smell it, I started getting pollen on my face from the anthers right here. So anything, a large moth coming towards it or whatever else we can, um, you know, uh, guess might be the pollinator is going to get covered with pollen as well. So here's that hawk moth. Um, which would be one of the pollinators, but this is also something you might find on your tomato plants. And they love to actually like to get onto the fruit as well. There's a little more, there's that mouth part and a chrysalis. And these will, you'll find in the, in the leaf debris around the larval host plant. But I will tell you one thing, those, of these moths that might be pesky on your tomato plants, um, their camouflage does not fool cardinals. I've watched the cardinals come into my yard and just feast on these caterpillars. Um, and they're big and fat, so they're, they're good for the birds as well. And they're not gonna eat too many tomatoes, maybe move them off. So, when you have time, this, this link is a current link that works. Um, of course, the most famous beautiful orchid um, is the ghost orchid. And this is chasing ghost. And you have to put, if you're searching for it, you have to put orchid in there. It'll take you looking in haunted houses. But this is um, one of the, um, just the incredible little, 16 minutes of exploration on what is actually pollinating the ghost orchids. And I'm not gonna tell you which moth that is. It's not that one where you could actually see some orange. Oh, I'm probably gonna give it away. And you can see this orchid, it's right there. Um, oh my gosh, I just went blank. Um, yeah, but that's not the name of the, that's not the name of the park. It'll come to me. Um, it's Audubon Park. So a biologist, Peter Holohan, I actually discovered when I was looking at Dr. Kalahawa's um, lab website. Um, you can see Peter Houlihan there. So I think he must have been part of that lab. Um, but he's, he's measuring the proboscis of uh, the giant sphinx moth. And he's looking at different giant sphinx moths. And, you know, they all have a proboscis or, or tongue that's long enough to get to the nectar on a ghost orchid. So if you look at that long neck there, just like the neck that was in um, the photo of our, of our lily, our hymenocallus, so it's got to get all the way down that long tube to get to the nectar. Um, what they found is that the giant sphinx moth, actually the proboscis was too long. It could get to the nectar without getting close enough to pollinate. Um, and it uses the custard apple as its larval host, which custard apples like to grow by the water side. And they used to be very common along the Miami River. This is another beautiful moth. So I just want to say, maybe you want to pay attention to this moth. Uh-oh, I don't want to give it away. <laughs> and maybe you want to make sure we have some ficus trees in our landscape. if We want to keep the ghost orchids in place. Um, these ficus trees, yes, they get big. This is another large tree, just like an oak tree. But again, like a superfood. Um, just those berries and everything that it is a larval host for, including the beautiful ruddy dagger wing butterflies. So, yeah. and my best photo I ever took cedar wax wings, they were feeding, they were feasting on the berries of, um, of the ficus at uh, 80 Barnes. Cool.
one of our eco parks. So giant sphinx, yeah, this is uh, this one's fun. Um, I love some of these these caterpillars that you we've had maybe twice since I've been here at Extension. Someone has brought in the frangipani hornworm caterpillar, mm -hmm. and this thing looks like a snake. It's so big. It's fatter than your thumb. And it's about six to seven inches. Wow. And wow, what is it? We tried to find devil's potato to plant at Camp Mahachi, uh, Girl Scout camp, so that we could attract this cat, this tetrasphinx moth, which doesn't look like much moths. Sometimes they're caterpillars are the most interesting part, um, just so we could check this, this uh, caterpillar out. Look at that. Oh, my goodness. I mean, I guess you might like kind of freak out if you uh -huh. saw that, but um, I would just be like totally fascinated. And you can let them crawl all over you, okay? <laughs> um, but it says it it has it's has hairs which stick deeply. I've never had um, I I've never had uh, any bad experience. So maybe maybe they were all gone because I've handled them carefully. So this is a rule of thumb. Make sure you do your research before you start cutting caterpillars of any kind. And if you do touch, please, please be careful with them. We don't want to harm them. So we're, we're finished. I'm ready to take some questions, but we know the issues that affect all of our pollinators and we know what we need to do. And above all, we need to appreciate them and we need to make sure that we get the plant sources in there for them. So thank you, everybody. Any questions? I know we're about five minutes over. Yeah, we do have a couple questions. Sure. Um, the first is um, from Pamela. She asks, what are those encased moths that attach themselves firmly to the concrete walls outside of the house? Oh yeah, those are called bagworms. Um, and I think that's actually, I can I can send that out to everyone. It's pretty fascinating. Um, I think that's the female in there and she never em, em, uh, emerges from that. It looks like a bag of sticks that she's got carrying on her body. And they don't do any harm. They just look might look bad. A lot of people get concerned. They're, they're not gonna eat up any plants or anything like that. But I can uh, put that up and share it with you guys. So, yeah, it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, I, I get those guys too. They're pretty gross. Well, <laughs> if you look at them up close, it's like there's there's like all this little collection of small pieces that uh -huh. look like sticks. I find them um, fascinating. Okay, Maria. Okay, yeah, moths are probably bigger than butterflies. I say we keep looking. <laughs> Victoria asks, how can hummingbirds be attracted? Oh, you want to have the nectar sources for hummingbirds. Um, and maybe we should do, I think Tony's, is Tony going to do uh, bees next? He's going to yeah, do I bees. So. At, he's, I know he's going to do bees at the Cybrarium, but we do need to do a butterfly. And we can share the publication on hummingbirds because, yeah, if you have those, well, Firebush is one of them. Uh, there's there's quite a few just great nectar sources um, that have you know yeah. they're they're mostly red and they have good nectar and they're going to be attractive to hummingbirds as well as as butterflies. Yeah, hummingbirds especially like those long tubular flowers um, that are obviously long enough for them to access the nectar. So the secret to attracting a plethora of pollinators like butterflies, moths, and birds. To your landscape is just to diversify the amount and types of flowers, different colors, different sizes, different shapes, um, and that will enable you to attract the most species to you. Have lots of pollen sources, different landing platforms or tubes, you know, and and have those different layers so they can have protection and etc. And then um, our final question is not really a question. They're just asking if we could. Um, Post the ghost orchid video. Oh, absolutely. I'm we're gonna watch it again after I finish <laughs> and get goosebumps all over again. Well, thank you everybody for joining us for lunch today. And we look forward to seeing you back again next month.